Good evening and welcome to Footy Furnace. Let's get straight into it. Jimmy Bartell, the Hall of Famer, welcome to you. Evening, Tom. And Lee Matthews, the Hall of Fame legend. Good evening to you. Evening, Tom. These are the Sunday results then. Three games today. It started at uh, Marvel Stadium where Port snapped a three-game losing streak. Carlton's won five in a row. Hawthorne has also won five in a row for the first time since 2018 and seven of their last eight. We'll get to those three games in a few moments' time. But first of all, let's get to the ladder, Lee. The top nine is taking shape and there's very little gap between third and eighth. Uh, well, Sydney in a great position. They're about four games ahead of third now, so they've got the top two sewn up, you'd think, with eight games to go. And Carlton are going really well, but it's very tight from about third to 13th, and we see that the Lions have finally found their way into the top eight for the first time this year, so uh, they're in good form and they're going well. But a few of those teams, I reckon you're sort of your Essendon, your Geelong's, Collingwood, Ad Port Adelaide, they're not going great. Some of the teams just outside the eight, Jimmy, might well be looking much better than them. Yeah, I agree with that, Lee. And the Hawks, as you mentioned, Tom, uh, Sunday's result. And they're one of the few teams that actually had a win and didn't really progress rapidly on the ladder. That was due to their percentage. But they're on fire. They've won their last four games. Uh, you look at Gold Coast, a really important win against the Pies at home. Uh, on their road to 14, which you'll touch on a little bit later, Tom, it's still important they've got to hold their home four which they did well, and the Giants missed an opportunity to really cement a place in the eight. Well, I look forward to grilling you on the Giants in a few moments' time. Of course, they're absolutely under the pump. Let's get to Marvel Stadium today, where Port Adelaide was too good in the end for St Kilda. It wasn't a beautiful game, Lee, but talk us through how they got the job done. Well, I think we'll probably start at three-quarter time. It was one of those, uh, those combinations, St Kilda, Marvel, and a low-scoring game. So when we got to three-quarter time, Port had a 13-point lead. Cooper Sharman got subbed on. He took this big floating mark, kicked the first goal, and in this good contest under the ball, he created the goal. It said Higgins kicked, and all of a sudden, uh, St Kilda have got the couple of goals, and it was a fairly even from that point on. There was no one could really score a goal from that point, and uh, Port Adelaide uh, just kept kept going. Steele had a chance to potentially uh, draw the game, but the uh, spoils fine line footy in it hit the behind post. So of course it was a uh, it was a, a boundary throw in. And this was the last free kick. The game, this decided the game. From this point onwards, the Port win front. They had a shot at goal that George Yates missed. And very emotional game. They've been under a lot of pressure, Port Adelaide. So to be able to find a way just to get home, you can see almost the relief on Ken Hinckley's face. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see that emotion on Ken Hinckley's face after the game when he spoke to Fox Footy. And how are you feeling? Uh, pretty hard. It's been a tough week. Great boys. Great boys. I really like the fact that we're under the pump and we just stuck at it. It wasn't easy, but we got there in the end. You know, we're two points from fourth. It felt like we're on the bottom of the ladder and I get why. I really appreciate the fact that we've been playing poorly, but we're doing our best to keep it right. How much does it cut you personally, that pressure? Oh, it's part of the job. Unfortunately, you, you don't want it, but, you, you know, well, I want the job. So I've got to put up with that. So Ken Hinckley's clearly uh, had a rough week, Jimmy, and it's, there's a lot of us against them, but the them in this case seems to be Port Adelaide fans, which is so unusual. Yeah, look, he's been there for 12 years and they want to see success, and I don't blame, blame their supporter base, but what I know about Ken Hinckley, because I have known him for quite some time, yeah. I've always admitted that, but what Ken does really well, he connects with his players and everyone inside his football department. So that is why there's so much emotion. He got so much support from Connor Rosie and all the players, anybody who spoke to the media. So the decision for Port Adelaide will never be, has Ken lost the group? You know, no. that's always one thing. Well, have they still got the group? Ken will always have the playing group and the footy department. The decision for Port Adelaide as a football club is... Do we go with different tactics, different list decisions? Different voice. Different voice. So yeah. it will never be about players and, I guess, the emotion, con emotional connection. And I'm sure Ken's completely aware of that himself. So the heat this week, again, is on St Kilda, who had a loss today. Um, they've had a poor season so far after playing finals last year. And, Jimmy, just struck me watching the Saints today. There's a lot of similarities between Mick Mouldhouse 2014 Carlton and Ross Lyon 2024 St Kilda. And I'll explain why. The first year that Mouldhouse went in, he replaced Brett Ratton, and a lot of people thought that was very unlucky for Brett Ratton. They played finals the first year, and this time in their next season, Mouldhouse had Carlton on five wins. At exactly the same time this year, a year and a half after Ross Lyon replaced Brett Ratton, again, unlucky in a lot of people's eyes, St Kilda have won five games. It just feels to me like the aura has worn off. And the question has to be asked now to Andrew Bassett and St Kilda's board. This is more at them than it is at Ross Lyon himself. Is this the right call? And a year and a half in, I think the jury is absolutely still out. 
Yeah, I think they've got, again, another discussion. Are they playing the right style? Do they have the cattle? I remember when Ross Lyon first came in to the job, he said, I need to find out about the list. And it still seems like they're still trying to work out who fits where, who can they attract. They've had a number of attempts at luring some pretty high-quality players from other clubs. Tyson Stengel was one of the more recent being uh, spoken about. He turned his back on that to stay with the Cats. But uh, I think it's all about system. We know Ross can coach defence. But a lot of people are going, all right, what's the next layer? And they just haven't found that next layer uh, just yet. And I don't think their list is good enough anyway. So they need to be aggressive. But how they can turn it around, I said a few weeks ago, I think they're absolutely in no man's land. Andrew Bassett Lee did an interview with Mark Robinson of the Herald Sun this weekend where uh, he continued this complaining and whinging, um, I guess, pattern that he has uh, had for most of the year. He said he wasn't a fan of the father-son rule, which I think is a bit ridiculous given Nick Rewald has three sons, Lee Montagna has a son, and he doesn't like the academy system either. It, I, I just... I don't think that Andrew Bassett should be worried about the issues of the game and the AFL when his own club is in the right order yet. Well, it's an interesting situation. What is the uh, president's role in, in all of this? And the president can uh, say a lot of words. You, you can sometimes look at that and think to yourself, well, he's been very successful in the business world. But the football world is very different. And is Andrew Bassett uh, sort of doing that and, and working out what works in footy? And, and, uh, but anyway, he was a, there was a lot of uh, complaining, wasn't there? A lot of whinging about St Kilda's situation. On the woe, a bit of woe was me about, uh, about that. But maybe that is just uh, a president exercising their muscles. And that is a bit in the St Kilda DNA. The woe is me. They pride themselves on it. But it's deep in their DNA. Uh, may, maybe. But Tom and Lee, uh, I think the player or the poster boy for St Kilda's woes whenever they're going bad is Max King. And so the discussion has always got to be, especially under Ross Lyon, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it the delivery into Max King? Or does Max King just need to be better? And he did have a great day. And they tried to use him in the ruck, but that was very limited. Not really as what Joe Danaher, which Lee has suggested in in the past, playing in the ruck, and he'll touch on that shortly. But when you look at just the numbers, they're 17, well, actually 18th for efficiency, kicking the ball in the front half. So they butcher the footy in the front half. So if you're Max King, you can put any other big key forward, and it's going to be very difficult if the delivery into 50 and coming through the front half is poor. But just some numbers on Max King alone. So, again, we're weighing up the chicken and egg, and I reckon it's absolutely both. For top 20 players where the ball's kicked to, so one-on-one -on -one contest... Mm. He's the third best at winning him. The only issue is he's the third worst at losing him. So what happens is there's no draws. So there's no soft drops. It doesn't bring the front and squares involved. You don't get any ball ups or throw in. So he's either win it or the opposition turns it over and away they go. So um, you've got to decide, is it the ball movement up the ground? Or does Max need to be better? I think it's a bit of both. Well, I think Ross Lyon was watching Footy Furnace a couple of weeks ago, Lee, when you suggested that Max King should play in the ruck. And this was Ross Lyon after the game discussing that role for King. When we subbed out Campbell, we needed a second ruck. So we just sent the runner out. And he said, whatever you want, coach. And he sort of wanted to do it. So we'll, we'll sort of try to grow that aspect because it just frees him up a bit from yeah. getting sat on. And we want to get a lot of clean ball to him. It can yeah. be hard. So in a weird way, that, that's a bit of a win for us as well. All right, St Kilda's a watch. Carlton is a watch at the other end of the table, Jimmy, because they had a fantastic win against the Tigers today and it was all set up with this amazing goal spree in the second quarter. Talk to us about it. Yeah, the Tigers are pretty brave up until the half and then the Carlton really flexed their muscles, you know, put the big boy pants on and showed why they're second on the ladder and Richmond's got a stack of injuries and going through what they're going through. This ball there was touched off the boot. It wasn't called touch, but Harry Mackay was able to get a goal and it kick-started that 15-minute patch we touched on where six goals were kicked by the Blues. Richmond just couldn't get their hands on the footy or on a Carlton player. They couldn't lay a tackle in that 15 minutes. Uh, Carlton had 20 more, 29 more disposals. That man is like a Kelpie, Sam Walsh. He just keeps running and running in that 15-minute patch. 17 touches and a goal. Cripps had nine touches and a goal for a total for 40 back-to-back 40 possession games for Cripps. Walsh 26 and two. Newman again fantastic off half back with 28 touches. It was good to see the others, as Lee likes to call them, um, contribute on the scoreboard. Fantasia, four goals, and Fogarty had a career high, three goals as well. So a nice, even performance. Put up a big score, but Richmond brave for about a quarter and a half. All right, no team flicks a switch, really, like the Swans, the Blues and the Pies, and that's the reason, I guess, they're at the pointy end of the ladder. But uh, Adam Uze, after the game, discussed Dustin Martin's subbing because of a back injury sustained during the match. Oh, he just seized up. Um, he tried to go back out there for one more rotation and he was just battling, so it was pointless. Um, 
and we had a, we had a fresh guy that we could bring on. And I think he's I'm not sure if he's ever been sub before, but for him to put his hand up to say his, his back's just a bit too sore at the moment and, and give Banksy a go um, was a credit to him. Lee, what did you make of this one at the MCG today? You mean the subbing of Dustin Martin? No, or, the game, the game uh, itself. The well, I, I was just really impressed, and I've spent it a few times, and you mentioned it. I mean, Carlton kicked 16 goals outside Kurnow and Mackay. So they're finding a way to score big without the two big forwards kicking half their score. So that's a real progression, and they, they, they are really consolidating themselves in that top two, aren't they? Yeah, but Dustin Martin, I mean, you can, I guess you can get a, a sore back, but it's all these things that happen as you age. Things just start, don't work as well. I'd be, uh, I would be thinking that Dustin Martin will finish his career at Richmond. I wouldn't have thought there's any thought he'd be going anywhere else. But do you think he can play on next year? Well, that's another question. I'm just saying, I couldn't imagine another club would think we'll pick Dustin Martin up and give him a year or two. I just think Dustin will either finish this year or next year with Richmond. That's fine. Uh, but there's all the signs of the ageing process are now on his shoulders. We'll know more in the next two or three months. Uh, speaking of ageing, there's some Carlton players today who had some injuries. Uh, Adam Saad with an ankle. Uh, Zach Williams in his milestone game with an Achilles. Uh, Matt Owies had a rolled ankle as well. And Matt Kennedy hurt his medial ligament in his knee. Uh, the news from Carlton is that Kennedy is the most serious with that medial and the rest should be OK. So that's good news. Yeah, the Kennedy one was uh, really worrying because there was no one around him. It's a bit tough to see there in the contest. But his knee just buckled on him and he was pretty sore straight away. So, fingers crossed that is not as bad as it seems. And that's a real worry for Carlton as well because he's been a really good player for them now for probably the last couple of years. Yeah, West Coast was uh, done pretty convincingly by Hawthorne. The margin was 61 points. The Eagles now have just won eight of their last 59 games. But let's focus on the match in general, Lee. How did it play out? Well, Hawthorne, they must be the best 13-plus team uh, that I've seen after about 15 rounds. And they started outstanding. Now, Sam Mitchell would be uh, frustrated because they dominated the game, but they were 17 points in front at quarter time, 17 points in front at half time. So that was the frustration. They just weren't getting it on the scoreboard. But gradually, as the game went on, they started to get it on the, on the scoreboard. I mean, they were dominant. Their midfield was outstanding. Uh, McGovern, Bar Barris in defence were pretty good uh, for the Eagles, but uh, they, won, excuse me, they won the clearances. Newcomb Day, Jath Moore was fantastic. Uh, but they, they are in really good shape, Hawthorne. I mean, they've they got a lot of players you don't know a lot about, but they were outstanding today. Won the clearances, won the contested position, and they cut the Eagles apart with their ball movement, eventually won by 61 points. They had, like, 60 to 33 inside 50s. They, they, they prevented the Eagles having an inside 50 mark at all up until three-quarter time. So that was a dominant game. They could have won this by 100 points. They were terrific. They were in really great form. And the Eagles, I've got to say today, were as bad as I've seen them play in this last few years when they've struggled. They, uh, they were really off the pace today. Uh, Lee, how deep do you think Hawthorne can go? Because there's a stark difference between the first five weeks of the year and the last couple of months. It is. Well, you go on in the last five or six weeks, they could be up in the top four and you'd think, yeah, they, they deserve to be there. But, yes, they started the season so bad. And we see the numbers there that just indicate how bad the West Coast were compared to Hawthorne. Now, Hawthorne made them that bad. I know Hawthorne are in really good touch. I mean, they're, they're really playing as well as anyone in the competition over this last six or seven weeks. So who knows how far they can go? They're only a game off, uh, off about fourth position, as we know. So, no, they're in a really exciting team, Hawthorne. And, you know, Watson and Ginnivan, two new guys to their front six, they've been really good, give them life and energy. They're quick, they're mobile, they're athletic. No, they're a very good team. It's just unbelievable that after winning those three flags, or four flags in that one era, they're now uh, getting their team together for the next assault on a premiership while other teams stay at the bottom of the ladder. Hawthorne in very good form.